Hi there, and welcome to a really exciting interview episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. I get to be here with Shauna Amick from Johnny and Friends, which if you have not heard of Johnny and Friends, you will today. And I'm just so excited to, to bring this special guest here to you to talk not only about her work with Johnny and Friends, but her experience and her story, which I know is going to be a blessing to so many of you listening. Shauna's passion for the inherent worth and dignity of every human life was solidified when her third child was diagnosed with Down syndrome, a near fatal heart defect, and some other genetic abnormalities. She's a speaker and author and a disability rights advocate, and she shares the unique gift of viewing challenges through the lens of God's word, and she just does this amazingly, and you're going to find out as you hear from her and as we share some of her resources, that she's just amazing. So she serves as the director of radio ministries for Johnny and Friends, and she can often be her encouraging listeners alongside Johnny Erickson Tata. So Shauna, thank you so much for coming and being on the show today. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So we always begin our episodes asking our, uh, when we do an interview, asking what is your favorite prayer closet? And it could be as off the wall as you want it to be or something very traditional. Sure. Uh, well, uh, the, the honest answer is my bed. And you know, it, early in the morning, right? I mean, certainly we pray without ceasing. And so um, I, I suppose we could, all of us say, we just have this walking uh, prayer closet wherever we are, whether we're in the car, or at work, or in the kitchen doing dishes, whatever it is. But um, some of the most intimate moments with the Lord are when I wake up, and, and that's always, you know, early, like so many women, so many moms, when it's dark. And um, I've gotten into the habit of lighting a candle. So that's like really the only light for, for the beginning part of my time with the Lord. And just um, spend it in quiet prayer. And then, you know, eventually, of course, I have to put the light on because we want the Bible to be part of, at least I do want the Bible to be part of my prayer time. And I can't read just by candlelight. <laughs> um, but it's that first thing in the morning, just being, um, being alone with the Lord in the dark of the morning. I know. In one of our recent episodes, um, my podcast partner, Alana, was sharing about how that, that's one of her favorite times of prayer, too, is just, you know, before everyone else is awake, just being in bed and thinking and talking to God and like enjoying that quiet time. So can you tell us a little bit about your family and your kids, your husband, where you live? Sure. I'd be happy to. Um, well, my husband, Steve and I, we have three children. So we have a 20 year old girl, a 16 year old boy and a 14 year old girl. And our, our youngest is Sarah and uh, Sarah has Down syndrome. And you already had talked about her. So you mentioned her to your listeners. Um, you know, we, we lived in the Boston area for my whole life until about three years ago. We moved to Southern California to be uh, close to Johnny's home office in Agora Hills. And so it was a big transition and certainly one that was done with a, a lot of prayer. Yeah. So and we're going to talk more about what you do with Johnny and Friends. Did you work with Johnny and Friends before and you just transferred because of just to be closer to headquarters? Exactly. You know, the way I got involved with Johnny and Friends was as a mom, you know, as a mom, really desperate mother who needed the support of uh, everything that Johnny and Friends has to offer. So um, I started with Johnny and Friends Greater Boston as uh, somebody who was being served and then became a volunteer and eventually the area director position for that part of Johnny's ministry opened up because um, what your listeners might know is that Johnny has offices all over the country. So um, I ended up serving as area director for Johnny and Friends Greater Boston, which then grew into Johnny and Friends New England. And then it was about three and a half years ago, uh, she invited me to move out here so I could actually be in the home office. Well, this would probably, I wasn't going to get into it until later, but I feel like this would be a great time to just share kind of an overview of what Johnny and Friends does and, and what you specifically do before we get into your story. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm so glad you asked that. So we, um, 
evangelize and disciple people affected by disability. And we also train up the church to do exactly the same thing. Um, our, our scripture for the entire ministry is from Luke 14, where we are encouraged by Jesus himself to go out into the streets and alleys and the dirt roads and country lanes and bring in the blind, the lame, the disabled, so that God's house will be full. So that's our mandate from the Lord, and um, that's what we do. And we do that through a number of ways. Uh, one is, like I already said, uh, training the church to be welcoming and embrace families affected by disability and have uh, disability ministries within each local church body. But we also do things like family retreat, and that is a week-long uh, family camp where the whole family comes, not just the child with a disability, but mom and dad and all the siblings, and they enjoy a week of you know, worship and music and recreation and just fun, uh, uh, learning how to be together and get closer to Jesus and closer to one another. And then one, one final program, I mean, we have so many more I could go on, you know, for a long time, but the other one that I'll mention right now is called Wheels for the World. And that is where we take um, used wheelchairs, sometimes new, but often used wheelchairs, we refurbish them so that they are like new, and then we distribute them in developing countries all over the world so that, um, you know, literally there are people crawling through dirt streets right now because they have no access to a wheelchair. And it is our delight to not just give them a seat of dignity in their own wheelchair, but every wheelchair that we deliver uh, comes along with the gospel in whatever that native language is. Oh, that's amazing. Did I see that for, for Johnny's birthday, she had uh, some kind of special drive to provide wheelchairs. That's right. Yep. Johnny just celebrated her 70th birthday. And uh, alongside that, we certainly had those campaigns where people could donate to the cause. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we are getting close to distributing our 200,000th wheelchair. Wow. In the year. Yes. And of course, I always got to say, and remember, that's all those folks hearing the gospel right alongside getting their chair. That's amazing. Well, I've I've always loved your ministry, and I just really hope that everyone listening will go. And so, it's what is the website? It's Johnny Johnnyandfriends.org, correct? You got it. Yep, okay. Johnnyandfriends.org, and Johnny is J O N I. Yes, and just to check it out and see whether you're a person affected by disability, or you have a loved one with disability, or just want to help become more aware of how you can be more welcoming or how your church can be more welcoming to those with disabilities because all of us I know know someone that um, that has a disability and it would be just a really amazing just so much information so you guys do so much so yeah definitely check that out um, well what I really, what I would like to do now is just to jump into your personal story because when you shared your story, um, I just, I, I know that there was, we actually had a question and we, um, we had a podcast episode recently that addressed the question of what, uh, how do you pray when you find out that you're expecting a child with Down syndrome or another kind of special needs child and this timing just couldn't be more perfect. We already aired an episode where we talked a little bit about that in general terms, but this is such a specific, mm -hmm. you know, this is what you went through. So I just would love to hear your story. Um, so could you just begin by telling us the story of, of when you found out that your third child was diagnosed with Down syndrome and just kind of try to help us to understand how you felt and how it impacted your faith at that time? Mm -hmm. Mm, sure. Um, well, I was four months pregnant with Sarah, and I was laying on the ultrasound table and doing what so many of us think is just the routine. We're going to find out if we're having a boy or girl, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I found out I would be having a girl, and I also found out that she was going to have a, a severe heart defect, and um, we could see not just her heart defect, but all kinds of um, deformities through the ultrasound. 
And uh, that's what I could see even with my untrained eye. And what the doctor said they could see is, uh, is Down syndrome. Mm. And um, I'm, I'll, I'll share this piece of my story because it's my story. Uh, they immediately uh, started pressuring us to abort Sarah. Uh, they decided that there's one cure for Down syndrome and that was termination. And so um, I, boy, I had an opportunity right there in that doctor's office to prove what I had said I believed for many years, that um, all life is sacred, that uh, God knits us together in our mother's wombs the way he has designed, that we are God's image bearers. And, uh, and I said, no, we will not be aborting our daughter. Um, I remember the doctor actually pushing me further and saying, are you sure, Mrs. Amick, this is not going to be easy. And uh, you know what the Holy Spirit reminded me in that moment is that Jesus did not come to make life easy. He came to make us holy. And, uh, and I, I affirm, no, we, we are not going to abort, to abort our baby. And so that was a case closed for the rest of the pregnancy. Um, I was in shock. This was not what I was expecting. Uh, you know, I, I went in thinking, do I need to go home and buy little pink dresses or a little blue sailor suits, right? Um, so really that whole evening was pretty much just crying and, um, woke up the next morning, uh, and oh my goodness, I walked around. I don't even know for how many days or weeks, literally clinging to the word of God. I would carry the Bible with me everywhere, walking around the house, um, sleep with it on my chest, uh, just so desperate for a word from the Lord. And um, if I can share, uh, I mean, he gave me several scriptures that held us through the next five months and beyond, but um, it was from Matthew chapter seven that um, really became my prayer for the next five months of that pregnancy. Uh, can, I, can I read just a little from there? Okay. Absolutely, yeah, as much as you want. So from Matthew seven, I'm gonna uh, start with verse seven. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, would give him a snake? If you then know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And you know, I can remember having the word open uh, to that scripture and standing on my porch and every morning, uh, you know, before the sun would rise, I would be out on that porch with my eyes uh, raised to heaven. I would read the scripture and I would pray, Lord, I'm asking, I'm seeking, I'm knocking, I'm pounding on your door, and I am asking you for bread. Um, I'm asking for a fish. And, you know, again, I'll be very, um, I'll just share <laughs> how, how dark my heart is. Um, I would pray, don't let this baby have Down syndrome. Um, I can handle a heart defect is what I actually thought uh, because that can be repaired, but we, we can't change Down syndrome. And, um, you know, I'm not proud of that, but that's, that's the truth. So I, I prayed that, like I said, for five months. And then on a beautiful June morning, uh, my baby was born with a heart defect and Down syndrome. And um, we stayed uh, in, obviously in the hospital for a few days, Sarah had to stay at uh, the children's hospital for a little over the first three months of her life. Um, just, she went through her open heart surgery at six weeks old. Uh, she did not have the ability to eat. So she needed a feeding tube surgically implanted. There were, like I said, a slew of genetic abnormalities that all needed to be addressed. And, uh, after just a little bit over than over three months, she was finally ready to come home. And um, so the night before the day that we were told it was time for Sarah to come home, I, I went home to sleep in my own bed. Um, certainly over the course of those three months, there were many nights I just slept on the chair next to her hospital crib. But I decided that night I was going <laughs> to sleep, you know, in a bed and gear up for this big day the next day. Mm -hmm. And when I woke up that morning, um, I laced up my, 
my walking shoes. And my husband said, hey, wait a minute. I thought we had a plan. I thought you were going to go get Sarah. I was going to stay here with the other two kids. And, you know, today was the big homecoming. And I said, oh, I'm going to go get Sarah. But um, I've got some unfinished business with God. I need to, I need to hear from him. Um, and again, I'm just being honest. I hope I'm not offending any listeners, but, um, I felt very let down by the Lord that, uh, Hey, I asked, I was seeking, I was knocking. Um, and in my opinion, I was given a stone. So I told my husband, I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to pray. This will be a prayer walk, which is a habit that I not only had at that point in my life, but I, I maintain now that while we're walking, we're, we're praying, we're, we're walking with the Lord. And when God answers me, I said, I'll come back. <laughs> and I wish you could have seen his face because it was kind of like the, oh my goodness, she's never going to come back face. Wait, is she going to come back? <laughs> Uh, I walked for about four miles and, um, you know, I had kind of run out a road at that point. And so here I am, I can see my house in the distance. It's maybe 300 feet away. And um, at that point, I'm actually, you know, challenging the Lord uh, in my, I don't know, my ignorance, my um, desperation and saying, you, I'm, I'm going to walk right by the house, Lord. I'm not, I'm not going to get that child until I hear from you. And oh my goodness, it was in that moment that I heard the Lord speak to my heart in such a powerful way. It made me uh, buckle over, like hands on my knees, knock the wind out of me. Um, and this is what he said, Shauna, I gave you bread. You were asking for a stone the whole time. And you know, it was a combination of a changed perspective uh, that all the, I don't know, bitterness, um, anger, uh, you know, shattered dreams, that it, would, it was because I, I didn't have the right eyes on my situation. And honestly, in that moment, buckled over in front of my driveway, my whole perspective changed. And beyond that, <laughs> I had heard from God. Okay, God answers prayer. And he was faithful, not just in answering my prayer in that moment, but in all the days and all the prayers up until that moment. And so, I mean, in my heart, I practically skipped up to the door and I grabbed my bag and my car keys and kissed my husband and jumped in the van and went to go get <laughs> my baby and all the, you know, medical equipment that we were going to need to set up our own little hospital room in the house. And, um, you know, that scripture will always be precious to me because of how God used it in, in that moment in my life. Well, and looking at that time while you were pregnant, when you had read that same scripture and, and just, you know, in your mind, okay, well, God's, God's not going to give me a stone. He's going to give me what I'm asking for. But I just, I love that shift because I think that happens to all of us in so many different ways where we think we know what's good. You know, we think we know and, and he knows, he knows what's good and it's not always what we thought in the first place, but yeah. Exactly. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, we, how many of us, right? Probably all of your listeners, uh, if we said, Hey, 10 years ago, if you would have written your story, would it look anything like the way it looks now? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, so that, that answers my next couple of questions. You covered all of those, but what I want you to kind of rewind, I think you needed to rewind because at this point she had had her surgery and she was coming home, right? That's right. I wanted you to talk a little bit about um, in the article from Fear to Hope that you sent me that I was, that I read about that time in the hospital in Boston. Um can you talk about sort of the turning point when you were given Sarah to walk around with and you went up? Could you share that whole story sure, with us? Sure. <laughs> I uh, love yeah. it. It's very powerful. Yeah, uh, You know, as it is when most people are going through 
um, a crisis, a tragedy, uh, you know, their desert, whatever, whatever words people use to talk about those intense seasons with the Lord. Um, so often we find out they're the sweetest moments with him, right? That that's yeah. where we hear his voice the loudest. So um, the way that that um, evening or that story was Sarah was six weeks old. And really for those whole first six weeks, I mean, when she was born, there was a team in the delivery room to whisk her away to the neonatal intensive care unit because we knew that she was not going to be strong enough to, to, to survive on her own. The only reason um, she was able to grow and thrive in my womb is because my heart was doing all the work for her. But, uh, you know, immediately she had to be hooked up to life support. Sarah was um, connected to an intricate mesh of, you know, tubes and wires, and you just plugged into what I've come to call the Starship Enterprise at this point. It was very <laughs> impressive. And, um, and so, you know, I never got to hold her because there was too much life support equipment in between us. I might be able to reach down and, you know, touch her cheek in between different tubes or, mm -hmm. or touch her little hand. Um, and again, she was, she was practically lifeless. I mean, you couldn't even tell that this child was breathing, uh, if not for the beeping of the monitors, because uh, she was just so weak. And so we knew the surgery was on this appointed day. And the um, evening before, I set myself up for an all-night prayer vigil. And so I had a big old coffee. I had my Bible. I even had... Um, praise music. And I was prepared to stay up all night just doing battle over my baby in prayer. And I did that. Uh, and, and then at about midnight, the nurse walks in. And I thought, oh my goodness, she's going to tell me to turn off my music or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she just so sweetly and gently without saying anything at first, she just started mm -hmm. unplugging my baby. And then she reached her hands down into Sarah's hospital crib and lifted her out and put her in my arms. Mm. Um, this was the first time I was holding my baby flesh to flesh. And I was like incredulous, you know, my eyes wide and my mouth hanging open. What are we doing here? It was very confusing because for six weeks I had been told she, she can't survive without these machines, right? Right. And before I could even ask, the nurse just said, you know, Mrs. Amick, I think you should take Sarah for a walk. Um, you've got 20 minutes and you can go anywhere you want as long as you stay in this hospital. And I need you to be back in 20 minutes. And I started to, uh, you know, uh, what, what kind of question. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> and she just put her hand on my arm and she, you know, it, her eyes said everything. Um, and she just repeated herself, you've got 20 minutes and, and don't leave the hospital. And I knew right in that moment what she was saying, um, there was no guarantee that Sarah was gonna survive yeah. what turned into 10 hour open heart surgery the next day. And if my baby um, was gonna be called to heaven, she was giving me the gift of having 20 minutes of holding her heart to heart. So um, I had no idea where, what to do, where I was going to go. My whole, you know, those whole six weeks were just living in that little hospital room. Uh, but I went to the elevator and in a very childlike way, I wanted to be as close to God as I could be. So I pushed the top button on the elevator and, um, you know, had never been up there before. And when the doors open, I was met with the most spectacular view. It was a wall of floor to ceiling windows, just glass. And um, I gotta tell you, the Boston skyline at midnight is spectacular. So I went right up to the window with Sarah, of course, and I looked out at all the lights, right? And what I saw were just, you know, countless, thousands of souls in need of a savior. Um, up until that moment, the whole, not only the whole six weeks, but those whole five months of the pregnancy, I'm just confessing, it was all about me and my baby. 
I didn't have eyes to see beyond, you know, me, myself and I, but God so expanded my vision to see there are all these other people and what are they going through? You know, what are their prayer requests? How are they crying out to the Lord? Um, and so, you know, I knew I needed to pray, but the only thing that could squeak out of my mouth was this, Jesus, you know, just a little whimper of the Lord's name. And, um, and that was, that was the first time I had ever heard the Lord speak to my heart. Um, the bread and stone thing came later, of course, but what I heard him say is, I see you. I see you, Shauna, and I see that dying baby in your arms. And you know what? That was, that was what I needed. I just, I wasn't invisible. Um, he knew what was going on in Sarah's life, in my life. Not only did he know, I'll be so bold as to say he orchestrated. Yes, even disability, even heart defect. I mean, not a day goes by that I don't praise God now that Sarah has Down syndrome. I was so afraid of it. I was so um, angry about it. I was so disappointed that I was gonna have a child with a disability. And of course, what I realized is what was I afraid of? You know, just people with Down syndrome are people like everybody else. It doesn't matter how many chromosomes we have or how many working limbs we have or how many IQ points we think we have. <laughs> Um, it, God gave me all the strength and confidence I needed to be back, uh, before my 20 minutes was up and to, you know, just pray through that heart surgery the next day and, um, and to recount that over and over again in, in really the past 14 years, not just with Sarah, but with every, every challenge in life, because our God right through prayer and scripture always brings us from fear to hope. Oh, I love that. And, you know, I also, as you were talking about looking out on all of those people and just being aware that it wasn't just you, and then you talking about being grateful for Down syndrome, I just, I think, you know, looking back at that picture of the platform that God has given you, the, the, um, where you are now serving and evangelizing and equipping and encouraging thousands and thousands of people, um, whether it's people with disabilities or people that are supporting children with disabilities, um, would not have happened if you hadn't had Sarah and if Sarah hadn't had Down syndrome and I don't know that picture of looking out. I, I just picture kind of like you know God showing Abraham these are these will be your descendants and you know God saying this is I have something big for you and for Sarah, and I just I love that testimony and that you're able because that was my other question is do you embrace Down syndrome or like you said I mean it's you've taken it a step further and you're thankful for it because that was one of my questions to you is, sure. yeah. Yeah. You know, it, can I, can I just share something about that quick? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, you know, before I was involved with Johnny and friends, I was um, involved in the um, crisis pregnancy center mm -hmm. ministry. And so I really did counsel other women to choose life. And I did speak, you know, into microphones about how all life is equal. And that's like when I said in that moment, uh, when I jumped off the ultrasound table, I got to prove that I, I really believed that, yeah. um, you know, and, and yet, uh, oh, Sarah has, has taught me that in such beautiful ways every single day. Um, who are we, you know, that we think we're somehow better than a person with either a physical or an intellectual disability. Um, when the Bible tells us we are all equal in the body of Christ. Um, all means all, right? Those of us with yeah, Down yeah. syndrome, those of us who are wheelchair users, uh, and and um, I don't know. I think we we can forget that, and we can forget that you know what Scripture says about all of our brothers and sisters with disability. 
Yeah. Can you tell us about Sarah? Oh, oh my goodness. Yes. What would you like to know? She's a hot ticket. <laughs> just what she's like, what she loves. I just remember a story that you shared just very briefly in that article about how she worships and just how much you love watching her worship without any fear of who's looking at her. Just um, what are, what are some of the things that you love best about Sarah? Oh, well, you know what? I say Sarah is passionate. She is, um, she loves, she does love the Lord. Uh, she loves to worship. She loves music. Um, she will raise her hands and worship. Uh, she does not need to be taught. She never needed to be taught that. It's just what she does. And, um, so confident in who she is. I got to tell you, I wish I had half of her confidence. Um, she loves to pray. I remember um, it wasn't too long ago where uh, the speaker that day in church was inviting, who would like to pray? Who would like to come up here and, uh, and close us in prayer? And, um, you know, none of the adults responded, at least not fast enough. And here comes Sarah Hope Amick, right? She just jumps out of her seat and marches up and grabs the microphone. And um, she is... Uh, I, I call her practically nonverbal, you know, so she, she does have some words and um, I can understand her, but you know, not, she, she doesn't have a, a, a big vocabulary, but she just took that microphone and she said, dear God, you know, with all the passion you can muster. And she prayed for, I don't know, a minute. Um, you know what? Nobody but Jesus understood what she said. And I, it didn't matter because I believe the Lord was smiling at that moment and all of the angels in heaven were just applauding her. And then she said, amen. <laughs> and she handed the pastor the microphone and went and sat down. Um, so, you know, she loves to pray. She loves music. She loves to dance. Um, and, you know, we do get some looks, of course, because she... It has a visible disability. And um, what I say is if it's Down syndrome, okay, if it's disability that makes people stop and stare, then it's Down syndrome that's pointing people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I, yeah, I love that. And, you know, you shared a story about when she was little and, a little boy came up and asked, you know, what's going on? What makes her different? And you were able to use that as a way to share, you know what? You might be different from Sarah in some ways, but you have a lot more in common than you have difference. And I, I just think that's, yeah, I think that that is really, I love that story. Oh, well, you know, thank you. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, I would love to encourage your listeners because a lot of times people, they don't know. What do you, do you look? Do you talk? What do you That do you, is a great question. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what I loved about that little guy? He must have been all of four or five. Mm -hmm. um, he didn't know or he didn't think, you know, he didn't feel like it was inappropriate to say to me, what's wrong with her? Right. You know, and and he, he asked it out of a sincere, a pure heart. I believe he just could figure out, Hey, she's a little different than me. What's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and it gave such an awesome opportunity to educate him mm -hmm. and to say, well, you know, she looks a little different than you. Maybe she runs a little different, but guess what? She loves the swings. Do you love the swings? And he <laughs> said, yeah. And you know, before we knew it, they're off running off to the, to the swings together. Um, I wish a lot of adults would follow that you know, instead of just staring or not staring or, you know, avoiding. And unfortunately, that's sometimes the response that we get when we go out in the world. Um, I would love for someone just to, like you would for any other family, what a beautiful family you have, you know, and spark up a conversation. So. Yeah. And, you know, that brings me to my next question, which is kind of two-sided. Number one, d um, well, both during your pregnancy and then after Sarah was born, what, um, what were some of the most helpful and just things that blessed you, whether it's prayers that people prayed or things that they said, 
And then on the other hand, what are some of the things not to say? What could you encourage us not to say, not to pray, not to mm. do yeah. when you find out that someone that you love is either carrying a child with disability or after the child is born? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think what was most helpful um, was just even the ministry of presence. Mm -hmm. So uh, it doesn't have to be disability related, but too often, I think, when there is a crisis or um, what, what people really perceived in our lives was unanswered prayer, right? Because we had been praying for bread along with our entire community, right? And, um, and when we didn't get what we were praying for, right? A lot of people, um, I think, just didn't know what to say. So they didn't say anything at all. And, uh, you know, we ended up on what my husband calls the island of disability. That's a lonely place. You know, it's a, it's a place where you, I think people did not mean to reject us. It was more, they didn't know what to say. Right. Right. Afraid to say the wrong thing. So you avoid eye contact or go the other way rather than being offensive. Exactly. exactly. So what I would encourage is that people don't go away. You know, um, even if all it is, is a, a text or an email, a phone call, or how about an old fashioned card in the mail, um, I'm praying for you. Oh my goodness. Whenever that would happen, like if I would go to the mailbox and get a card from anybody, and even if all it said is I'm praying for you today, I felt like that was a gift straight from heaven. So um, that was very helpful. Um, there's only been a couple times when I when I switched, you know, the other side of the coin and you ask what was what was not helpful. Um, but there were a couple times when I would either be in church or, you know, a church type setting and somebody would come up to us, Sarah and me, and say, can I can I pray for her? And I would always say, yes. I mean, I'm never going to turn prayer down. Um, what are we going to pray? You know, what are we praying? And they would say, well, we're going to pray that she would not have Down syndrome. I mean, this is after she's born. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I wish I could tell you I would, uh, I would answer graciously, but there are some times I really embarrass myself. I mean, I remember one time I said, well, why don't you pray that I'll grow six inches by the time you say amen? You know what I mean? It's like, this is, <laughs> this is who God created her to be. We don't need to pray that she doesn't have Down syndrome. If you want to pray, you know, for her future and that God would use her to glorify him and, you know, that she would grow into everything he wants her to be. I'm all about that. Yeah, no. And I, I can definitely see that. And when we've talked in the past about, you know, different kinds of prayers and encouraging people through hard times with prayer, one of the things that, that can be, just extremely hurtful is is to do something like that or to imply oh well you didn't pray hard enough so that's why right. this thing happened or you know to pray that something that's already happened would be undone and yeah. yeah so what are the things that you love people to pray over your daughter mm. uh, well I certainly uh, I think I intimated that that she would bring him glory yeah Right. I think of the uh, scripture in John nine, where there's a man who's born blind. Right. And the Pharisees ask Jesus, mm -hmm. why is he blind? Did he sin? Uh, did his parents sin? And Jesus takes care of that. He says, hey, nobody sinned. This happened so that the glory of God could be put on display. Um, Sarah's actually got a shirt, a T-shirt that says this happened to show the, the power of God. Um, so I believe when she raises her hands in worship or when she marches up on the, the stage to pray, or even if she's, you know, she has, um, what Johnny calls a hug ministry, H U G, right. Um, she loves to hug people here when she comes into our home office, she'll give them a hug. If we go to family retreat, she wants to welcome people and give them a hug. I mean, she is a, a little ball of love. Right. So every one of us, as the Bible tells us, all of us have a ministry and we have spiritual gifts 
And, um, and these are some of hers, you know, joy, prayer, worship, music, hug ministry. Um, so I would lo love people to pray that she would just step into the fullness of um, God's call on her life. Yeah. And I just, I love that just going back to that, the scripture about bread and stone that she's the bread. There's yes. no need to pray right. that the bread would look different. You know, this, she yeah. is, she's the bread that God has given. And yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, I wanted to know if, if you could speak directly to a woman, because I know she or they are listening now who has recently found out that they are carrying a child with special needs. What, what would you say directly to her? What words of hope and advice would you mm -hmm. offer right now? Yeah, well, you know what, the first thing I think I would say is um, you can do this. That there's, there, fear not, you can do this. It's gonna be hard sometimes. It's gonna be worth it all the time. And that your baby has been created in the very image of God. And God has a great, great plan for your child's life. That God wants to use your baby to impact this world in a way that will not be accomplished by any other person. And it's gonna change your life for the better. So, you know, it, it's, it's just a matter of trusting the Lord. And I know that's really easy to say. And the only reason I feel like I can throw it out there is because like you, I've had to, I've had to walk through it, right? Um, there's support, there's support through Johnny and friends. My hope is that there would be support through each woman's individual church and family. Um, but I would just say, if I could turn back time, 14 years, and, and speak even to that panic stricken young woman, um, I would say, what are you afraid of? You know, everything's gonna be all right. And this is all part of God's glorious plan for you. Thank you so much for that, Shauna. I just, thank you so much for that. <laughs> that is such a blessing. Um, so Johnny had a quote that you included in, in the article that I, that I read from Fear to Hope. And Johnny says, life is hard. Trials are not for our pleasure. They are for our profit. Once you accept this truth, you transcend it. Yeah. And I just think that's, that's something to leave. I would love maybe someday to have you back to talk more specifically about people that are struggling with chronic pain or struggling mm -hmm. with chronic disability themselves. I, I think today this is what we were supposed to talk about. Um, but that's one of the things I love about Johnny's testimony herself is that, that she, she lives that message that, okay, she is very frank. This, this trial that I'm going through, this chronic pain, it's not pleasurable, and, mm -hmm. but, but it is for my profit. How can it, something be pleasurable and yet profitable? Only in God's kingdom. And so, yeah, but... Um, yeah. She is the real deal. And I will tell you, and, and you know this and all of your listeners as well, but um, there are so many free resources on our website. If they go to johnnyandfriends.org, uh, certainly we have things that are, are you know, books and, and audio CDs and stuff that are for purchase, but there's a whole section of free resources about exactly what you're talking about, um, things that will encourage people, um, strengthen them, bring them new hope. And that little uh, booklet from Fear to Hope that you've mentioned is actually on there for free also. Oh, good. That's what I was going to ask you is where they can get that. And you mentioned another booklet about expecting a child with special needs. Where can they, can they also find that at Johnny and, uh, Johnny and Friends? Yeah, that is also on the website. It okay. is, um, and it's, it's very, very cheap. I don't want to, I can't remember how much it is. It might be something like $4.99 for a package of five or something. It's called My Baby Has a Disability. Okay. Life-Giving Questions and Answers. And that is exactly, um, it answers that question you asked just a couple moments ago. What would you say to the woman who either has that diagnosis in utero or just had a baby with a disability? This little book uh, was written for that woman. Great. 
Well, yeah, I would encourage our listeners to go check that out. And as I said before, whether you're personally affected by disability, just go because I think it's so important for all of us to understand more about disability and just be aware that that we are not as inclusive as we'd like to think that we are and and just raise awareness in our own churches and and in ourselves so that we can be more inclusive to people with disabilities and their families. Well, I can't thank you enough for for being this voice and this advocate. Um, I'm so thankful for you and your incredible ministry. And I know that God is using you to really uh, uphold many, many people in their walk with the Lord. So thank you again. Oh, thank you, Shauna. And we're going to close in prayer for you today. So how could we pray for you and for Sarah and your family? Oh, well, thank you. Well, you know, I, I always take prayer for my kids. And again, that they would have a close walk with the Lord and that they would, uh, you know, as we said, step into their calling. And um, as far as the ministry, uh, I would ask for prayer that um, we would just reach more and more people with the gospel. All right. Well, I will do that. And there was a prayer in your in your article from Fear to Hope that that you had written. Is that okay if I read that also for our listeners to close? Sure. Sure. Okay. So in the end, the, the prayer that I'll read is actually from Shauna's um, article. All right. Well, thank you, Shauna. And I will close us in prayer. Okay. God, we just thank you so much for this time just to reflect on you as provider. You are Jehovah Jireh. You are the almighty God who provides every one of our needs. Nothing is a mistake mm -hmm. in your plan, God. The things that we're afraid of, the things that, that we think are stones that are given back in response to our prayers are all bread. We acknowledge you as good, that you withhold no good gift. Mm -hmm. And I thank you so much for Shauna, for her honesty, her openness, her lessons that she has learned along the way and just her praise of you as as the almighty god who provides bread for his children that he loves we thank you for sarah god we thank you for down syndrome we thank you that you have created her in your image perfectly to bring you glory god we just lift her up to you today we thank you for her confidence we thank you for her joy. We thank you for her fearlessness to praise you and worship you in ways that we can only wish that we could do, God. Lord, I just pray that you would glorify yourself through her and in her, that through Sarah, many people would come to know you, that many people would be humbled and realize their need for a savior, realize their need to let go of insecurities and worship you with abandon. God, I lift up Shauna to you and I just thank you for her advocacy for people with disabilities, for their families. And I just pray that you would open doors for her ministry. Just open them wide open, Lord. I pray that you would remove any barriers that would stand in the way of reaching more and more people that need you. Lord, I pray for her other two children. I pray that they would also, just be walking in your purpose for their lives, God, that you would allow them to fulfill the callings that you've placed on them, that they would glorify you as well, that they would point people to you, that they would reach the destinies that you've planned for them from before the foundations of the earth, Lord. I pray for her marriage. I pray for their family, that you would just rain blessings down on them. We lift up Johnny. God, we just thank you for her victory over cancer recently, Lord, and just pray for continued victory in that area. We just pray for her continued ministry, that you would allow her to just continue to praise you and worship you, even in the midst of chronic pain, that she would be able to point other people to you, and that her voice would be heard, Lord. God, we just thank you for this time, and I pray specifically for anyone listening today who is suffering, who feels desperate, and I just want to close with this 
prayer from Shauna. Dear Jesus, when my situation seems desperate, help me to see you working in the midst of it. Renew my vision and increase my strength so that I can get through this trial in a way that honors you. Forgive me when I doubt you, Lord. I surrender my life to you and trust that you are always with me. Use my life to point people to you and give me the courage I need to take the next steps with you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. You're such a blessing. Oh, thank you, Shauna. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. We'd love to hear from you, so please leave us a comment to let us know what questions or topics we can address in future shows. Then hop over to prayingchristianwomen.com slash journal to download your free prayer guide. We're so glad you joined us for today's show, and we wish you God's deepest blessings as you draw closer to Him and change the world one prayer at a time.